welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse journey through Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew serves as a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In this Gospel, Matthew seeks to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. For those of us who aren't Jews, Matthew helps us to see our Savior King more clearly and through his gospel, learn to live well in his, in Christ's kingdom today. So grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the gospel of Matthew, and let's learn about our Savior King and his kingdom. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17 as we continue our study through the first gospel. In this series, we've entitled The Savior King and His Kingdom. I'm going to start with a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, we do come to you now. And um, Lord, I, I often pray and, and ask, Lord God, for, Lord, for those who come with heavy hearts and, and burdens and difficult things to, to help them to lay those aside and Lord, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be bold and pray that for myself today and, and for um, our family as Lord God. Um, we rejoice that you've taken Pat to be with you, uh, but Lord, there's also that, that, that sadness that, uh, that we are separated her, from her for a time. And so we ask, Lord God, for the comfort that you provide. We ask, Lord, for the, the faith to believe and the, and the courage to move forward. And Lord, for all of us, Lord, whatever else we bring into this time of, of whatever it might be, Lord God, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to set aside all the stuff that is life and, and take just a, a brief time and allow our heart to be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, minds, eyes, and ears, Lord, that we might know you better. And by knowing you better, walk with you more closely. We love you, Lord, and we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew's gospel was written from the perspective that Christ Jesus is king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. So we don't see him manifesting those characteristics in the world today. It, it, we won't see that really until he comes back again, but he's always been king, he's always been Lord, and that, that is never going to change. And as we study through this gospel, we see, we see the, the references to and the pointing to his deity as well as his royalty and, and all the other characteristics. We see glimpses of them. And, and one of the things that the Lord has been ministering to in my own heart as we go through this study is how awesome God is. Amen. Is our God an awesome God? Yes. You know, the problem we sometimes have is we read through things like the Gospels and we see these miracles and these profound statements of the deity of Christ and, and, then what, and then we connect that to his sacrifice for us. But if we read them long enough, we can get very familiar with them, almost to the point where they don't fill us with awe and wonder as they should. And one of the things that the Lord's been ministering in my own heart, I've been, I was, I was talking, I think it was to Larry this morning, you know, saying, you know, I, I you know, this job I have right now as pastor, it's, I, this, I've been a pastor longer than anything else I've ever done in my life. So it is kind of what I've been doing for a while. And so I've studied, I've taught all of these things and it can be so, I can get to something and I, I've caught myself, oh yeah, I know this story. I know how to teach this account without the sense of just, wow. Do you see what he's saying? Do you see what's going on here? And allowing the awe to fill me. And, I, and, I, and I've, I've just sensed the Holy Spirit trying to draw me back to that childlike faith. Well, I read these things and say, oh my goodness, what an amazing God we serve. So it's my prayer, that's one of the things that I'm drawing out of this, is that's one of the things we do. We get this sense of the wonder of the fact that we are called 
to walk with God. And all these things are real and true, and they're amazing. And if we had that childlike faith, we'd look at it as if it's the very first time we saw it. Like, wow. Like the very first time you see Magic Mountain or, or Disneyland. Wow. There's Mickey Mouse. Whatever. Whatever one gets you going. And we, we've got to be very careful not to be famil so familiar. We should be familiar with the text, but not so familiar that we lose the wonder of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You see where, where that's possible? Our text is another one of those amazing displays of, of some of the reality of who Jesus is and who he was when he was walking on the earth. He was king. He was, he was the son of God. He was savior. And these accounts that we get, these, right now we're going to look at four verses today, four whole verses. And as we look at them, it's not just some simple little statement. It's, it, is, it is a declaration of who God is and we understand it and we, and we start to learn how to apply it to who we are and what we do and how we walk in this life. Chapter 17 began with the transfiguration. Okay, that was a big deal. The glory of Christ showing forth. And we sometimes forget, oh yeah, Moses and Elijah were there too. Like, wow, a couple of dead guys showed up. But they weren't dead. That's, that's an encouragement to us, right? Right? Okay, we believe. We believe in the resurrection, right? We haven't sang that song in a little while. I'm sure it's coming up next week. I believe in the resurrection. It won't. He's probably already got that scheduled. Now, after, the, after the transfiguration, we have the healing of the demon-possessed boy. Another, again, it's a radical display of the power of the Son of God. So now we find Jesus on his way or at Capernaum, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone, nope, wrong chapter. Try this again. Try chapter, 24, chapter 17. When they had come to Capernaum, it's right there. And it said, it's, never mind. I'm a little distracted this morning. You'll forgive me, right? Yeah. Those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Now, it's a little unclear if, if these guys were trying to trap Jesus into doing or saying something or if they were just doing their job because um, that was what some people did. The temple tax was something that happened. It's interesting that this account only occurs in Matthew, who was formerly a tax collector. So there's that. The temple tax was not a civil tax. Matthew collected civil taxes. This was a religious tax. This was a, this was a, a tax for the temple. It was collected to provide for the temple services, for all the worship and all the, the different things that went on at the temple. It was provided, and it's taken loosely from one of the instructions out of Exodus chapter 30, but it, it's not a direct connection. At some point, ex, the, the, the requirement in Exodus chapter 30, which was connected to um, um, the counting of the people, morphed over time to become something they did every year, and they did it to provide for the needs of the temple. <clears throat> And, and, and they may have been trying to trap Jesus, but he uses it, obviously, for, um, to, to make a point. He said, Jesus said, yes, or Peter said, excuse me, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? So Jesus, Peter walks in, and Jesus anticipates what he's going to say, what he's going to ask. What does that mean to us? Jesus knew. He knew. It's a display of his omniscience, his knowing. He knew things that were not humanly knowable. God knows everything about everything. 
including our most secret thoughts, including those deep heart things, including those things that you couldn't utter if, you, if they paid you a billion dollars. You couldn't say the words. So they're just so deep inside of you. Jesus knows them. God knows them. Psalm 139, 1 and 2. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. God knows you. And rather than being something that freaks us out, it ought to be something that encourages us and helps us and comforts us. Most of you know Kelly's mother went to be with the Lord on Thursday night. And I'm, I'm sure when she's ready, she'll share about that event. There were some beautiful things about it. It's obviously very hard. And at a time like this, when something like this happens, our mind is filled with so many different things. And so, so many thoughts and, and questions and doubts and wonders and just memory, all this stuff is just rushing around in there. And, we, and it might be hard to express. And some, sometimes the only way to express it is to cry. It's just let the tears flow. I can't say it, but I'm going to let that out. And those moments when we feel overwhelmed, we feel like, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Just rest in him. Lean back into his arms because he knows. He understands. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we find those times when we can't say the words, we can't even think of the words, we just, the feelings and the thoughts, all this stuff, is just, it's just a mess in our brain. Just lean back. Let him comfort you. Let him give you the peace and the strength that you need at that time. Jesus knows what Peter is going to ask him. He already knows. And what he says to him, he says, Peter, do, do kings tax their own children? And, and, and the answer, you know, because in that culture, there were kings, and when they taxed, they did not tax their own children. Why? Because the money was going to pay for them. It was, it was their money. It was coming to them. Yeah, we don't have anything equivalent in here because theoretically, you know, you know, those in authority are actually paying taxes too. We're not going to get political in this moment and question whether or not it actually is going on there. But he's saying, he's, he's saying just, the point he's making is this tax doesn't apply to me. Remember, who is Jesus? The Son of God. And the temple was for what purpose? Worshiping God. Which God? The one God represented in the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so for Jesus to pay the tax, he would be paying a tax to himself. Another interpretation of this that some have put forward is that <coughs> Jesus is king of kings. And so, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a tax that's collected for the king, then, you know, then it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to pay it. And his disciples are the sons, so his followers. So in, in essence, he, it could be interpreted that what Jesus is saying is that neither Jesus nor his disciples are, are they are exempt from this particular tax. Now, what we need to understand is Jesus is not saying that it is wrong to support the work of the temple. It's not what he's saying. He's only saying that he is exempt from that tax, from that work. Jesus would, would soon go to the cross. And when he went to the cross, the temple became obsolete. The, camp, the temple became irrelevant ultimately to worshiping God. The, the symbolism of that is when, the, when Jesus died and the veil was torn from top to bottom in the temple, representing the opening of the way into the Holy of Holies, that's what that represented. The temple was no longer 
in the place that it had. And, and within, within a few decades, it was gone and has not been rebuilt. It will. Ultimately, that's another message. Jesus was establishing his church. That was the way to approach God. Through Christ was the way to approach God, not to the temple. But at the moment that Jesus was dealing with this, it, it was still through the temple. That was still the right way to do it. You know, as Christ followers, we are under no obligation to support the work of the ministry. Some of you have to say, oh, praise the Lord. I've been tired of giving them money anyways. I'm sure none of you. But the New Testament encourages it. Not only does it encourage it, it ties it directly to our faith. It makes it an issue of faith to support the ministry, to support the work of the ministry. The Apostle Paul said that if we have benefited spiritually from the work of the ministry, then we should be willing to share material, materially with the work of the ministry. We, every week, we give people the opportunity to participate in the work of the ministry financially. We do it every week, and we're not ashamed of it. We're not embarrassed by it. We, make it an, we believe it's an act of worship. It's an act of faith, and so we're going to keep doing it. We believe it's an important expression of faith. But we also believe the if, when, or how much somebody does that is between them and the Lord. We don't ask. We don't, we don't measure. We don't, we don't do any of that stuff. We trust God. God's going to provide for us. We give you the opportunity to do what you believe God is calling you to do and, and trust him to do the rest. But Jesus is saying here in our text that he is exempt from the te temple tax. But then he tells Peter to pay it. Let's read that, verse 27. Or verse 26. Verse, verse, Peter said to him, from strangers, Jesus said, then the sons are free. Verse 27, nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first, and when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. By paying this tax, Jesus was submitting himself to the ruling authority, to, to, the, to what was right and appropriate in that time. This was not a spiritual law at work. It was a morally neutral issue. That is so important for us that we sometimes get all tangled up in, in issues that are morally neutral. I had one happen this morning. Sermon illustration. I, had a, I got a message. It was actually from last Sunday. I got a message from one of our neighbors, very upset that we are parking in front of her, of her facility. I didn't even know she was there. I, I, it was the first I'd heard about it. She's very upset that we're parking in front of her space. There's three spaces right down here in front of us, right next to budget. Is that, it's a morally neutral issue. You know what we should do? Don't park in front of her space. <laughs> it's a non-issue to me. Okay, you don't want us to park there? We won't park there. You know, we, we sometimes get all tangled. But, but, but wait a minute. I should be able to park there. It's morally neutral. It doesn't matter. And if we make a big deal out of it, the problem is in us. It's in our heart. Things like that, we've got to be so careful. Is this an issue of right and wrong? In God's eyes. Not your eyes. In God's eyes. Because you might say, well, I should be able to park anywhere I want to. Okay, first off, you need to know that that's never true. You can't just park anywhere you want to. <laughs> the budget guy was telling me they got tickets for parking their trucks out here, which another thing, they, they, the, the red zones out there aren't true red zones for whatever, whatever that means. He's told us we should park out there, but okay, whatever. It's, not, it's morally neutral. And when you come to an issue where you start getting worked up, ask yourself that question. Is this biblically an issue of right and wrong? 
Can I go chapter and verse and say, where, is, where, where do I find that thing about parking in front of that lady's place? It's got to be in first ridiculous 12 somewhere. No, it's not in there. When you find those things, just, okay, fine. Don't make a big deal out of it. And that's what Jesus is doing here. This is a morally neutral issue. It wasn't right or wrong to pay this tax for the support of the, of the temple. It didn't cost him anything. Well, it wasn't going to cost him anything because he's going to find a coin in a fish's mouth. But he wasn't going to make a big deal out of it. The reason was, if he made a big deal out of it, it would cause those people to stumble. And it could cause others to stumble. The world was not ready to receive him as king. He couldn't stand up and say, no, I, I'm exempt from that tax because I am the king of kings and lord of lords, the son of God. The world wasn't ready to hear that. And because it was a morally neutral issue, he didn't want them to believe that he was despising the worship of God in the temple. And so rather than having them have that opinion, have that thought of him, he said, yeah, let's, just, let's just pay it. But he does it in a very unusual way. He tells Peter to go do something that Peter loves to do, right? Peter was a fisherman. Peter, go fishing. And he tells him, the first fish you catch will have a coin in its mouth. Take that, fit, that coin and pay the tax with it for you and me. How did he do that? How did it work? Did Jesus attract the fish to Peter's line and then miraculously put a coin in its mouth? Or, or did he cause somebody, you know, in a boat somewhere to, you know, toss a coin or drop a coin into the water and the fish, you know, it's, it's glittery, so he, he caught it in his mouth, but he didn't swallow it. And then he goes, how did he do it? You know what the answer is that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how he did it. He just did. How are these miracles explained? One thing is proven. Christ's dominion over creation. However, however the pieces came together, it was because Christ has dominion over all of creation. How do we know that? Well, we've heard it before. He told the storm to stop and the waves to cease. He's, he's healed over and over and over again. All these things he's done, he has dominion. Which interestingly, I didn't want to get too much into this. It can get us in the weeds too fast. That Adam and Eve had dominion too. When they were created, they had dominion over all things, all creation. Now, I, don't know, I don't know to the extent of what that meant for them, but I know what it means for the Son of God. That means there's nothing outside of his ability. God can do whatever we need him to do. And he is unlimited in his ability to do it. I love this account. This is the strangest weirdest way that Jesus could have fulfilled this particular thing, right? I mean, he could have just reached into his pocket and grabbed out a coin. I don't know if they had pockets, but whatever it was. You know, reached out, you know, and, and it miraculously, you know, was there when he, he could have just handed it to Peter and said, go, go pay the tax. No, he sent Peter down to the beach. I love that. There's another interesting thing that's going on here too. This is not the first miracle that Jesus has done just for Peter, right? Peter, Peter is involved in many of Jesus' miracles, and he is the sole one. We, you know, Jesus, his mother-in-law got healed. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Je Jesus helped Peter walk on the water. Later, he, he's going to free him from prison. All these, these things, these ministries that, that he did to Peter, he did lots of very public and very, you know, you know group-oriented miracles as well. But he did the, many of these miracles just for Peter. Peter would later write in 1 Peter 5 and 6, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. They may exalt you in due time, casting 
all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Peter knew. Peter knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God cares for him. Why? Because the son of God cared for him. God knows you. He called you by name. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows all your needs, all your wants, all your hurts, all of your dreams and wishes, all of your fears and worries, all of all, everything there is to know about you. He knows them. And he cares about it all. In my Bible, there is no verse 28. Is that true of your Bibles as well? The, you know, the chapter ends at verse 27. What happened? Did Peter go fishing? Did he catch a fish? Was there a coin in the fish's mouth? Did Peter go pay the tax? Yes. Well, well how do you know, pastor? Because Jesus said it. When Jesus says something, you can absolutely believe it and trust it. Did Peter catch a fish with a coin in its mouth? Yes. Without, without hesitation, without question, I believe it to be true. In 1 Kings 8.56, it says this, there has not failed one word of all his good promise. Not one word of God has failed and we can push that into the foreword. Not one word of God will fail. Of anything that God says, not one word will fail. Now that's a very encouraging thing when we're dealing with something like we're dealing with right now in our family. Did Jesus, did God say that if you believe in Jesus Christ that you will be saved, that you will go to heaven? Yep. Can we believe it? Yep. Can we know that Pat is in heaven right now? Yep, that's a very comforting thing to know that. Listen, here's one of the aspects of mature faith. Mature faith trusts in the bare word of God. Just the words. The words, just the simple words. Whatever those words are, we trust those words. We don't need evidence. We don't need Proof. We don't need eyewitness accounts. We don't need confirmation from other places in Scripture. The Bible says it. I believe it. Period. Now, all those other things are good. We like all those other things, but we don't need them. Mature believers, mature faith takes God's word at its face value. We don't need anything else. It is his word. Therefore, it is true, which word. All of them. Every last one. What about, what about some of the ones that people, you know, have questions and, and controversies about? Nope. They're all his word. Every last one. And you start listening to people and, and their criticism of scripture and, and this thing or that thing. Here's my advice to you. Stop listening to them. They don't know. They don't trust God. Because if they did, they would trust his word, every last word. And the moment you start questioning, well, I don't know if, that, if that's true, that would just, just blah, 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 your faith is starting to crumble. And you keep down that path, and you'll end up in a very dark place or believe some other weird nonsense that isn't true. I've seen it happen. It is a tragic thing to behold. We don't need evidence. We don't need proof. Just we simply seek to know God and what God said, and then we believe. Just believe. If God said it, it is. Warren Wearsby said this. If we trust the king, king is Jesus, or we could say the king is God, he will meet our needs as we obey his word. Here's the reality Faith must include obedience. Put yourself in Peter's place. Jesus says to him, okay, go pay the tax, so I want you to go down to the lake. I want you to, you know, cast in a line, which is unusual because 
Peter seems to usually use nets, but he's going to use a line here. The very first fish you catch is going to have, have a coin in its mouth, and it's the exact amount that we need to pay both of our taxes. What would you have done if Jesus had told you that? Well, hopefully you do what Peter did. He's, I, I believe he did it. Now, I don't know what we don't know, because we don't have a verse 28 in this chapter. We don't know if anybody else witnessed it. We don't know if anybody saw Peter pull this fish out, grab it by the lip, reach in there, and pull out a coin. This miracle may have been for Peter alone at that moment. But then, here we are, almost 2,000 years later, talking about it. How many hundreds of millions of people have been ministered to by this verse, by these verses? Jesus displayed two divine traits in this text, omniscience and dominion over creation. If you remember in the, the multiplying of the loaves and the fishes, Jesus displayed his creative power to take literally, to, I mean, you know, what, to take from almost nothing and make something. And we know from, from the account of creation, he created everything from nothing. So we know he has creative power, but he also has dominion over creation. Not only can he create everything, but then he can also control it and have dominion over it, rulership over it. Jesus knows you. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, hallelujah. Jesus knows you. There are few things in life that are more powerful than that statement. Jesus knows your name. And he doesn't just know it. It is a part of him. He's, he has connected himself to you. He knows what you think. He knows how you feel. He knows what you need. He knows what you want. He knows everything, just as the Father does. In Matthew 6, 8, it says this, For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Before you talk to God about anything, God already knows. And because he has the power both to create and then to have dominion over creation, he can meet your need, right? Would, would you not say that that's true? If he can create out of nothing something, and then for everything that does exist, he has dominion over it, including people and governments and everything else in the world. He has dominion over all of it. He can meet your need. Now, he might do it with a miracle. Somebody say, I'd love to see a miracle. We've, we have seen miracles. Or he might do it providentially by arranging things to work out for you. Now, I don't know for a fact if this was an act of creation when, when this coin appeared in this fish's mouth. God, he may have created the fish and the coin and everything right in that. Who knows? We don't know. But we do know everything ended up the way God said it was going to be, the way Jesus said it was going to be. He can cause things to work out in your favor. And regardless of how he's going to do it, and this is the part that we have to, we have to you know, take possession of because we want to control how it happens. Anybody? Anybody willing to admit that you want it to go a certain way? Maybe we've even told God, God, here's what I want you to do. Now, we may not say it as boldly as that, but we'll give him lots of suggestions in our prayers. Regardless how he's going to do it, we have two parts, believe and obey. That's our parts. We believe and obey. For this miracle to have worked, Peter had to believe that what Jesus was telling him to do was the right thing for him to do and to go down to the lake, cast in a line, and try to catch a fish. That was Peter's part. Everything else was God's. 
He didn't need to know how Jesus was going to do it. He didn't need to know how that fish was going to end up there. I mean, Peter was a fisherman, so he probably had a pretty good idea how to catch fish, but he didn't, he didn't know how Jesus was going to get that coin in that fish's mouth. He didn't need to know. By faith, he obeyed. And that's how we're going to do it too. If we're going to, have, if we're going to see miracles in our lives, we get miracles working in the things that we need God to move in, we've got to believe and obey. What radical thing might God want to do in your life? What miracle might be needed in your life right now? In your life or your marriage or your family or, or whatever place God has put you, what miracle do you need or just a, the radical work that you need right now? What should we do? Seek God. God. Seek God with your whole being, as much of yourself as you possibly can. You seek him. You seek him in the word. You seek him in prayer. You seek him in service. You seek him in fellowship. You seek him every way you possibly can. And you trust him with as much of your life as you're able. This is hard for us because sometimes we, just, we're, we struggle to let go and let God be in control of everything in our lives especially those things that are impossible. When there's something impossible going on, we want God to do something, and we often, we might want to tell him how to do it. And if he tells you to do something strange, if he tells you to go catch a fish that has a coin in its mouth, what should you do? Do it. You don't have to ask him, well, but, but, but God, how, how are you going to do that? You know, how, how are you going to make that work? God would say, you wouldn't understand it even if I told you. Just do it. You don't have to understand. That's a hard thing for us. And for some people, it's harder than others. They just need to, I need to understand God. I need to understand how. I need to understand this. And God says, no, you don't. You just have to believe me and obey. God is still working miracles. He is still answering prayers, even hard ones. What should we do? Believe him, trust him, obey him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of this time and we've seen this, this radical miracle Lord, it began with this, this, this thing that, that others were calling Jesus to do that he shouldn't have had to do. But it was something that it, it just didn't, it really didn't matter that much. But Jesus took it as an opportunity to build Peter's faith. How often, Lord, do we miss those? Well, you bring us to some, some morally neutral thing where somebody is asking something of us, somebody wants something from us, and something inside of us says, no, I don't want to do that. But we don't really have a good reason not to do it, except, except our own flesh, our own pride, our own selfishness. And so I pray, Lord, as you bring us to those morally neutral choices and decisions that more frequently we would say yes and just do them knowing that there's a possibility that in the midst of that we're going to see something radical we're going to see a miracle take place as Peter was called to do something that, that was just weird and he did it and, and he saw you work Jesus and we can do the same thing if we will just trust you and obey. When we see this thing that somebody says, hey, this is what I want, and we don't want to. We'll be honest, we don't want to. And yet if we'll trust you and seek you and ask ourselves, what would the Lord have me to do here? Not what I want to do, not what I would do. Well, what would the Lord have me do? What would Jesus do in this moment? 
And if he tells you to go, go. If he tells you to do something weird, do something weird. And know that he's there. And through it, your faith will grow. And as our faith grows, we can learn to trust you more and more. And I, I believe, I believe, Lord, it's in those little choices that we make that we prepare our faith for the big ones that are coming. When, when somebody tells us to not park in a certain parking spot and we just say, okay, we won't park there. That's no big deal. It's no, it's no, it's no, hard, it's no hardship for us. I might have to walk an extra 12 feet. Oh, no. Pray, Lord, that you'd give us the heart to just trust you in those things, knowing that, that there may be a day when you ask us to do something hard. And when that hard thing comes, that we are so used to saying yes to you, Lord, that we just say yes, and we do it. Give us that kind of faith, Lord. Give us the faith to just trust you no matter what. And I pray, Lord, as we go through these, we, meaning our family, goes through these next few weeks, you provide the comfort and the faith that we need during this time, and you'd help us to do all the things that need to happen now. And all of them have this, this hard emotional piece to it. Lord, it's in this time that we can feel your comfort and know your peace and lean upon your strength. And so I pray that for our family, for all of those who are connected to this. And I pray for this church, Lord. I thank you so much for them, for the comfort and the, and the encouragement and the love they've shown. I, I just, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't imagine being with a different group of people. And I thank you for them, and I pray for your blessing upon them. And as we go from this place, Lord, we go knowing, Lord, that you love us, and yet you have this amazing plan for us. If we will just believe you, trust you, and obey you, help us to do that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us as we learn more about our Savior King and His Kingdom in the Gospel of Matthew. It is our hope that these messages will help you grow in your faith. If you have any questions or there is anything we can do to help you with that, please do not hesitate to connect with us. Go to calvaryfv.com connect to find all the ways that you can connect with us. As Christians, we are all connected in Christ. One of the ways we would like to engage with you is in the area of prayer. Please let us know how we can be praying for you. Send us an email to prayer at calvaryfv.com or text the word pray to 951-419-5396. If this material has been useful to you, please share it with someone. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus.